Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the January meeting 2022 of the Howard Astronomical League. Uh, I'm very happy to see all of you here today. I want to let everybody know that this meeting is being recorded and um, uh, it'll go through to the end and we'll stop the recording. And if you want to hang on and keep talking, we'll do that like we do every single month. So let me start my share screen here. And okay. All right, everybody can be able to see that. And then let me arrange my other screen over here so I can see all of you. And we'll be all set. There we go. Great. All righty. So um, if you would all um, mute yourself, um, Yvonne, could I ask you to kind of monitor the chat, please? Sure thing. And I know everybody's very courteous in this grant in this group. Yep, they are. So if you um, if you keep yourself muted, please. And um, if you have a question you want to ask, just unmute yourself and jump right in. If you want to throw a question in the chat, Yvonne will watch it because I have a hard time uh, doing that much multitasking at one time. But we have a great meeting uh, planned for all of you today. And I'm really uh, happy that you've um, all joined us. Um, so as we always start out here, we have a little astro humor for you. Give you a chance. <clears throat> I think Wayne uh, Baggett worked on this project. There you go. Yeah, it was an abject failure. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I want to uh, welcome any new members and, uh, and guests. So if there's any uh, new members here, I know we have uh, uh, Glenn is here and uh, the, for sure. And uh, uh, Naeem, I think if I'm pronouncing his name correct, uh, um, yes, you did. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Naeem, I see you're, um, I see you're unmuted already. So uh, maybe you could introduce yourself to the group and tell us a little about yourself, and uh, we'll we'll go on to the next folks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, good after. Good evening, everybody. My name is Naeem Hawk. Uh, I'm an engineer. My hobby is photography and astronomy, and drawing, and uh, uh, and actually, you know, uh, David. Uh, Encourage me to join the group, uh, David Illig. So thank you for David. Oh, it's great to see you. Welcome. Yeah, thanks. Uh, there you go. Uh, Glenn? Hi, it's nice to meet everybody. Uh, Glenn Vonk, I'm a PhD scientist uh, on the life sciences side, uh, mostly a chemist, uh, led R&D uh, both here and overseas. And uh, love astrophotography. I've done most of my work with the DLSR and lenses and uh, tracker. So I'm looking to learn a lot from you guys. I took a look at a previous presentation and I just thought this was for me. So thanks for having me. Oh, thanks. Great. Welcome. Any other uh, new members or guests? Just unmute yourself and jump right in. Well, great. Uh, not seeing anybody else tonight. I'm Howard Dew. I'm the Emeril Vice Chair, and I'm, I'm here at an invite thanks to Bob Dottilly. Okay, nice to have you, Howard. Oh, Howard, I, actually, I know you, Howard. So um, you've been, you're on some of the email chains that I'm on. Uh, so uh, welcome. Uh, anybody else? Okay, so we have a lot going on tonight. Um, let me just tell you what's coming up. So we're gonna go through just a couple of things on uh, James Webb here. And then, um, um, and then, and then we're gonna go into the, uh, because this is our annual meeting, we're gonna have Joel do a presentation on the annual treasures report that uh, we're obligated to do. Uh, so everybody knows where we stand and what we've been doing in that area. We're gonna have the elections for the 2000, uh, 22 um, board of directors and uh, Jim Johnson will be leading us in that. And then we're going to um, move into um, um, our guest presenter. I will tell you more about in, in a little while. And, um, and then right after that, uh, uh, Dennis Conti has um, uh, prepared some uh, um, 
some information to show us on the actual direction that the James Webb is traveling. It'd be very interesting. And then I've grabbed uh, the, for those of you who have sub submitted some videos on the James Webb uh, traveling on its way, I've got those put in there at the same time. And then we'll get into our, uh, our, um, our images. And that'll take us well into and probably beyond our nine o'clock end time. So I just uh, think it's really appropriate right now to congratulate um, all of the teams and the individuals within those teams that uh, worked on James Webb and has such a successful mission to this point. Um, what you see there, so congratulations. I know we have some of the people on this call that, uh, that contributed a, a, to, the, to, the, um, to the design and the building of the James Webb. So it's just awesome and it's very exciting. And we'll be talking more about this. So what you see on the uh, bottom of the slide there is this was as of uh, 9.50 this morning. So we could see that uh, James Webb is uh, getting close to the L2 point. It's just a few days away and it will be there and everything's fully deployed as it's supposed to um, according to plan and it's traveled quite a way. So this is, a, this is an awesome uh, thing. And you could see up there in the upper left, just um, how many um, uh, people and businesses, government agencies, countries uh, were involved in, in the, in the uh, James Webb project. Quite, a, quite an accomplishment. Um, oh, Dennis, that jumped ahead. Of, I meant to put that slide before. I'll move it later. But um, so anyways, and the other project that's ongoing is I wanted to make sure we call attention to it is the Parker Solar Probe. Um, the Parker Solar Probe continues to amaze and it's just kind of uh, lost in, the, um, in all the celebration with James Webb and everything right now. But um, as you could see by the orbit, that the James Webb is, uh, that the um, Parker Solar Probe is going on, um, you could almost predict when it's gonna be in the news again. So, so go ahead. Somebody has something you wanna say? So, so you could see that, um, you know, the James Webb got within uh, like 5.3 million miles of the sun, which is- Parker. Parker. I'm going to do that all the time. Parker, thank you. Um, and actually touched the corona. And um, it's, it's and it survived and sent back. And the data is now coming back. So we haven't seen all the data yet that's coming back from that. It's come, it started coming back in December. And it's supposed to, last I read, uh, continue on into February. Does anybody else have any other information on Parker? That's so we'll, we'll, we'll follow this and then any other missions that you want to talk about, you just bring them to my attention and you can talk about it uh, yourself. Yep. There we go. As we move into the, um, the uh, treasures report and the, um, and, the, and the election, I want to take this opportunity once again to thank all of our, our officers and our committee chair people who have done such an outstanding job over the last year uh, during this once again uh, challenging time of COVID. And we, have a, we are a very active organization and it's because of all of these people for sure. And for uh, the, all of those of you who work with these people from in, in various capacities. So I'd like to give everybody a big hand and, and, a, and, a, and a thank you very, very much. Um, Tonight, we're just gonna talk about, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Jim here in a second. All right, I mean, right after Joel does his treasury report. Um, and we're only gonna talk about the, um, the elected officers. And then in the next month, we'll, I'll um, talk about the committee chair people, which are appointed positions and uh, a couple of the new committees that we're, we're looking to form up. So that'll happen next month uh, after we have the elections. Do any of the uh, officers wanna say anything? Current officers, anybody besides before we get to treasurer's report? Nope. So Joel. Okay, you're sharing my. Yep. So Joel's our treasurer, and uh, thank you very much. Can you see it, Joel? Yes. Next, please. Okay. 
Uh, that is our uh, bank account as of the end of December 2021 at M&T Bank. Um, all of our funds are held in one account uh, now, um, just called our operating account. Um, and that is was our balance as of the end of the year. Next. Um, I don't know if Ken is going to talk about membership at all, but just uh, uh, just a note here. This is as of, and it's changed a few uh, in the beginning of the month, but, and you can see our members, our total memberships, 282, total members, 353. And in our monthly meeting, I always uh, point down to the, uh, the figures down at the bottom uh, that Chaz put into the code a number of years ago to track our individual memberships versus family memberships. And that um, I'd say 10 years ago, that was probably 80 to 20 individual to family. And now you see the numbers now and very happy to see that as a group. Uh, next, please. Um, as can, wait a minute. Is that large enough there? Large enough to see? Now I just made it in mind full screen. Um, the, I, I think it's only fair because of the pandemic to put together the two years. So that's why I've separated the two income and spending and just get yourself situated to the, the numbers sit, sit there as far as the income and the spending to look at it in a two year um, time frame. Um, our Overall, our income, as you can see, is almost totally uh, dues driven. That number, $25 for individual, um, $30 for a family has not changed since the inception of how over 20 uh, years ago. Um, and as you can see, that brings in the, the bulk of the income each year. Uh, a little bit from donations and Amazon small income. Those of you who use Amazon, and I encourage you to go to Amazon small and even further encourage you to name how as your um, 501c3 of choice. And as you can see, we receive about $100 a year from that. Um, and as you see from the 2020 income, pretty much similar overall, maybe some other things um, tossed in. The equipment sale that shows from 2020 um, is uh, every once in a while, something will be donated to side accept the donation uh, with the understand saleable. I'm showing that my internet is unstable. Can you still hear me? Yeah, you freeze? broke up a little bit, but I think we caught most of it. Okay, cough that, okay. Try turning off um, your video. Yeah, turn off your video. Uh, will do. There you go. Thank you. Okay, and then as you see the spending, and that's what I wanna bring attention to. In 2020 was a typical year of spending our overall fixed expenses as a club, and you can see where that gets broken down. Um, are about $3,3200 a year. Um, and we have had not, and that was pretty consistent over 2018, 2019 as well, because we didn't have any major observatory expenses, which are the really only other expenses um, for our club as a whole. And in um, 2021, um, we um, put an auto as the, um, Dale Gent, we may have some um, information from the observatory in just a couple minutes, um, uh, helped re, um, clean up the Illig telescope and put and during the pandemic took it apart, put it back together. And for our public stars party and for our member use of the um, um, observatory, I did a fabulous job in 2021. And we have an autofocuser now. So that's showing the expenses, um, most of the extra expenses in 2021. So that was our observatory upgrade in 2021. Um, I'll stop here for a minute, um, but I do want to show the next slide as well. Um, if there are any questions here. If anybody has any questions, just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Okay, then next slide. That showed that $11,000 was at the end of 2021. Uh, Phil, is there, um, Dale, or is Dale supposed to do, or that's not part of the agenda, then I, if, I'm not seeing any recognition. I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Well, um, in the uh, January board meeting, um, Dale Gent, the observatory director, um, had brought forth after extensive uh, research and study and brought a great report to the board and made recommendations as to how the observatory could experience its next upgrade to help fulfill Hal's mission of both outreach 
um, and um, member engagement. And we authorize purchase of, these are the two big ticket items here, the filter wheel on the bottom and the color camera on top. Um, and another monochrome camera was purchased as well. Um, so as of January 15th, or when this bill is paid, instead of 11, nine or yeah. Joel, we lost so you. in our, our treasury, we will be at about figuring our fixed, I said we will be, um, uh, instead of $12,000 in our treasury, when this bill is paid for this camera, we will now have about $6,000 in our treasury um, moving forward with about $3,000 in the year of fixed expenses. So we feel in good shape moving forward. That's all. Right. Any uh, questions for Joel? So, I, you know, I didn't ask Dale to do a big um, uh, update intentionally on the observatory because we have so much on the agenda this week, but I will ask Dale um, and um, Victor, you know, next month to, um, you know, give everybody uh, an update from the observatory uh, and, you know, what's going on there and um, the plans for it. But once again, that's, we didn't have time to go into that, but I could tell you that um, there's been qu quite a bit of effort during the COVID time to take advantage of the downtime to really um, continue to build out Halo. Uh, for those of you who are um, new to the organization, uh, you, the Halo, H-A-L-O is the Howard Astronomical League, uh, Astronomical League Observatory. So, and so we call it Halo. And that's it. So Joel, thank you very much for the report. Um, anybody last chance for questions on the treasurer's report? Okay. Um, then uh, it's kind of an official part of them. Do we have to uh, make a motion to accept it as, or does any way? Just um, no, no, this is just part of um, our uh, responsibility as a nonprofit and make a, a report to the membership. Okay, great. Thank you. I have and, a question, Phil. And an, effort to, and an effort to be transparent. Okay, good. Okay, Joseph, go, Joe. Yeah, uh, so this is a colored camera that you bought. And so why did you buy a filter wheel with it? We have other cameras. Well, it's, it's we, not for we, this camera then. Okay. There, there are multiple kinds of filters you can still use with the, with the color camera. So the filter wheel is there to facilitate the use of those other filters without having to manually uh, swap them out. Sounds great. Give an example, Dale, of a filter or two you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. But we can go in this into detail on this next month so I, we don't hold up the meeting. But uh, we can, Victor good. and I can give a presentation next month on the new imaging system and yeah. the plans for it. Okay. All right. Yeah. Good question, though, Joe. Glad somebody's paying attention. There. <laughs> so uh, great. Yeah. Okay, Jim, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Phil. It's that time of the year again, January meeting. We um, elect our uh, next year, our next uh, board of directors. Um, this time for 2022, the term is for uh, February 1st to the next January 31st. So they'll be taking office in about um, a week and a half. I've uh, got some numbers here. Uh, next slide, please, Phil. Um, based on the numbers that Joel presented, the a quorum is 10% uh, of the um, members, and I've counted and verified uh, 34 members, so we do have a quorum. We have six elected positions, and we have one candidate for each of the uh, positions. Um, in lieu of a voice vote, I'm going to take a hands, um, raise your hand vote, and I'm going to flip through the um, um, all the thumbnails of all of you, see how many hands I see raised. Um, just members only should be voting. And if there's a family membership, just one person per family. Um, any questions before I um, take the vote? Are you going to ask people to physically raise their hands or use the physically, the physically Zoom raise your hands so I can so I can see? Well, Phil, is there another way to do that electronically? You could, you could do a hand raise on the um... The actions tab. On the actions on the action tab. Okay. I'm gonna have a trouble because I got a lot of stuff going on, so I'm just gonna raise my hand. Why are we raising hands? Okay, yeah, Jim, you gotta Jim. Okay. So so basically I'm gonna 
my, my intention was to ask um, to, to vote yes for this slate of um, candidates to raise your hand and I'll count those real quickly and then we'll see if there's any no's. So Phil, I don't have any um, experience with this um, reaction, so I don't know what I'm gonna see there. I yeah, wanted... well, once everybody's done, it'll stop flipping around. <laughs> What's Tim, that? if you open the participants list up, you can see who raised their hands. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, and then my... um, so react with a thumbs up if you um, are voting yes for this. Um, Sorry, of, we've all done raise hand. Raise hand Everybody's raise raising hand. hand. Yeah. Every, or, okay. Or One or the other. There you go. So let me go through real quick. All right. Seeing lots of hands. There's 22. Okay, I, I've got uh, 30 hands up already. Are there any no's? I think there's. All right, everybody turn off your hands. Yeah, here, put your hands down. If there's no's, raise your hand. Okay, I didn't see any. So uh, with that, the, um, the slate of uh, candidates that we have listed on the screen is elected for the term beginning 1 February two, uh, 2022. Thank you. Yay. Yay. I want to thank Jim. Um, everybody, you guys can put your hands down, go into your action things, because uh, some people will be potentially raising their hands for questions in a while. Um, I want to thank Jim for all the work he, he did. And um, he spent the last uh, couple of months uh, working with people, talking to people, and finding out they're interested in being on the board, being in other positions and everything. So there's a lot more put into it than is reflected in this one slide here. So. Um, Jim has done this for the last couple of years, and it, it's really, really helpful. And I want to thank everybody who um, who considered uh, positions on the board and who are going to be on committees and everything else uh, moving forward. So I want to thank all of you for participating in our democratic process here. So, so we are now official for 2022. And I'd like to make sure we all thank the current board. I know there's a lot of overlap here. I, you guys have done a great job of continuing to keep us active and engaged and busy during the pandemic. And I uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Let's welcome a new member, Richard Wren, to the board. Yeah. Hey, Richard, are you uh, on the call? He is. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. OK. So. There he is. Just wave your hand. I can see you now. There you Hi. Go. <laughs> wave my hand. All right. Thank you. Man. All right. So, Joel, I'm going to be coming back to you here for a second. I didn't forget you. Um, so here's the schedule for 2022 for our for our uh, scheduled star parties, our public parties, and our member party. Um, David uh, Stein has guaranteed clear skies and warm weather for each one of these. Um, so, uh, so this and this somewhere is somewhere there will be. <laughs> so this is all on there on the website. You know, Ken continues to do uh, and just a wonderful, outstanding job on our website. It's always current yeah. and fresh, and all this information, along with our meeting links and everything, is on the website. But um, we. We uh, Joel's been talking with me about having um, an event for young people, uh, kids in school, school age, uh, elementary school, um, prior to each of the star parties on the star part on the public star parties nights. And Joel, you want to talk a little bit about that in the committee? We're gonna, we're not um, gonna not, sure not not even so much just for elementary. Um, I mean, the background was my twenty some years with the Celestial Searchers group that was mostly an elementary school uh, group, um, but that helped contribute and also Hal's work the last 20 years and reflected in the numbers that our, um, um, let me turn off my video here again, that our star parties and our membership is reflecting a much higher degree of families. And at each of our socially distanced star parties over, during the pandemic, um, because I had done the Celestial Searchers, people tended to direct people to me, and I had at least one 
sometimes more families or, or mothers or fathers come up to me and say, is how going to do any kind of, you know, just general education kind of program or just something for something for families that we can all come and learn together. So, and during the past year, I also noted in, in talking to some people from other astronomical leagues of how they had, and how did this a number of years ago too, is that there might be a theme at the star party and that we might, Bob Savoy has been great of having his orrery and um, dem and tabletop demonstration, but maybe just to have one other thing or something that's a theme of the night, because we still get, we get lots of, um, each month we get uh, requests from scout troops and to have something that's a concerted effort and that interested members could then participate in when that it is published about two weeks before the public star party to be able to present something or do something that they want to feature their night through their telescope and have something a little bit more concerted. So we'd like to get some HAL members and we have a few that have voiced interest in um, education and outreach in the past year, some new, newer members and other members who may be interested in that over the next month. And Phil, maybe you'll talk about that as the new board discusses after the next meeting. Thanks. Thank you. So we're looking forward to that. And um, um, that'll be just another great addition to um, our events and our activities and our public outreach and social responsibilities. So I am now going to stop sharing my screen here in a minute right now. And uh, I'm going to allow Paulo to share his screen. I would like to thank Hi. our guest presenter tonight, uh, Paulo, Paulo uh, Casella, who's joining us all the way from Brazil. And, um, and Paulo is, is not a, a, a professional astronomer or physicist or quantum uh, physics uh, specialist. Uh, he's actually uh, works in the banking system in, in Brazil. And this is his hobby and his passion. And he's like uh, some of you, uh, he's created some of his own uh, software and he's got his own observatory and he's been gracious enough to uh, take the time tonight and it's very late out there. It's a couple hours later than it is here for him to um, to share his uh, what he's doing and his experiences with us. And like always, uh, you could put your questions in the chat. You could unmute and ask a question. And uh, Paulo, I'm going to hang on a second. You should be able to share your screen now and I'm going to turn it over to you. So uh, okay. let's welcome Paulo. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, are you seeing my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, basically, I'll try to, to explain to you who I am and what I do and the kind of research that we do here. I'm here at the observatory now and the, the telescopes are taking photographs from the sky. And uh, this observatory is, uh, I call dogs heaven because I have a lot of dogs here. And it's, uh, it was like an, uh, an, uh, an idea. And then let me show you my, a bit of my history. I, I am from Rio in Brazil. And this is the place where I, when I was young, like that, 10 years old, I, I've gone to the observatory. And this, it was an, an old and traditional observatory. And you can see uh, <clears throat> A very nice Clark refractor that's like a 18 inches or something like that is a beautiful. And uh, it's a place where I, I was born in, and I started to learn about astronomy. Then I decided when I was like 17, uh, going to the college, I need to decide what I do. And then I thought that astronomy was a very nice option, but uh, at the end, uh, professionally speaking, in Brazil, it it was much better to be an engineer because it, it you do have uh, much more opportunities. Then, at the end, I've I've uh, <clears throat> I've finished uh, electrical engineering training. Okay, then I am a specialist in mathematical models in electromagnetics and things like that. And then a bit after that, I've worked a lot of time in um, engineering. Then I've entered in the financial sector. I work in Central Bank of Brazil, and I am the guy of the models, risk models, and things like that. Then um, I've built here an um, observatory that you can see. It's a simple observatory, a roll-off, okay? 
It has like a six places for telescopes. I have a lot of scopes here I show you. Uh, this is, uh, I've done this today. Uh, you can see that the, the sky is clear. And uh, I have here a vision horizon to horizon because uh, Brazil is a place that's uh, like a, a 4,000 feet high. Then it's uh, the, 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 a plateau. You do not have mountains here. Basically, you can see from horizon to horizon. These are the telescopes that I have here. I have an RC-10, okay, a G8, G11, Losmandi, and that's big 8,300. A C-14 with Hyperstar. Some APOs like uh, William Optics FLT 98 and Z71. This is a mid-10 with a DSS-7 S big spectroscope. This is a mid uh, ACF 12 with uh, LH IRIS 3 spectroscope. It's a more higher resolution spectroscope. Some refractors as uh, uh, six and four inches refractor. And this is um, a bit uh, bigger. But it, this was, I designed this, this, this uh, reflector is a John Hall mirror. Okay, I've, I've got this from US. And uh, this is a serial design, and it's over a uh, HD 32 HPO mount, no counterweights. You can see that the weight of the telescope is a is a big telescope, and there is no counterweights. And and this this mount is the one that uh, I've developed here, the software for this mount, and uh, and because I've developed this here, uh, my friend in California sent to me for free this mount and. Uh, I put this telescope on, on, on the mount. I, I, you can see here, and I, I can show you, uh, let me share another screen here. Let me see how I do this. Uh, let me share another screen here, only for you to have an idea. Uh, that's uh, basically the Astro Beam, uh, my Astro Beam. I am not a, really an astrophotographer. I'm, I'm more on the research side. Almost all of these photographs are photographs that are, are made for some testing of the equipment or something like that. But you can see a lot of things and I would like to show you how this big telescope, the mirror is absolutely fantastic and how it can compare with more uh, usual telescopes. Then let's see this is a top peak in Astro Bean is a C14 a picture of uh, Copernicus in um, moon, okay? You can see this is, uh, I can show you, this is from this guy here is high resolution to 12 uh, 2020, is a Celestron Edge HD 14, okay? Then I, I will show you the difference in the telescope. Let me go to the full resolution, it's blinking here, I do not know why, but you can see uh, the full resolution in the C14. Then take a look in this, see these mountains here. Take a look in my image here, the difference. You can go really deep. You can go in details that are much, much, much higher than a C14. This is an example of a, how a telescope like this can perform. And I have a lot of other pictures here where you can later on you can take a look and see some other images that I've got. This is a testing image. It's basically for testing the optics and, and some other aspects of the telescope. Then let me go back to the presentation here. Okay. Well, then the, I've shown to you, this is this, this telescope, is uh, this photo I've made today. Um, it's running with, uh, I, I will change the, the CCD, the, the, the the camera, I'm I'm getting a 294 mm from Azul, and this one is a uh, uh, 1600 mm. And I have here two weather stations, all sky and meteor cams. You can see that the weather here is almost perfect in this time of the year. July is the winter here, and I have absolutely clear skies during this time, and the temperature is awesome because during the day is basically around seven something and during the night is 50 or a bit lower. Then it's a wonderful climate. I have also a seismograph here in the observatory and this is an example 
of, uh, of, of an observation here of an earthquake in Alaska, okay, and how it was detected here in Brasilia. And you can see that not only I can get the, the waves, but I can even measure the distance in, in degrees because of, I, I, can, I can see all S and P waves and, and surface waves arriving here. And I can detect basically earthquakes worldwide. And uh, I do this. I've detected the, the, the explosion of the volcano, submarine volcano here. And uh, this is a part of my library, astronomical library. I think that the old guys, old guys that love astronomy, will see a lot of things here that younger guys mm -hmm. do not really are familiar. Then I have basically uh, the full collection of Antonin Bekvar atlas, all, all kind of atlas. Uh, Skalnet, Pleso, or, or Atlas. Then I have also a lot of books. You you can see some of them here, and uh, and, and this is something that I I like much. Is that then I have a, a really big library of astronomy books here. I will try to explain for you some of the main activities that I do here in the observatory. One of the main activities is the supernova and other transient search. I've designed the software. I will show you in real time here because I'm getting some uh, imaging. And I, I do also spectroscopy, occultations, astro. This is totally wrong because I was translating here. Sorry. It's astrophotography, YouTube videos, uh, software de development, the ATM, because I've, I've made everything here this big telescope, everything I designed. And I also developed the software for us think that maybe that you have some interests. It's a totally crazy because a VR is a re, uh, uh, virtual reality software I will show it to you using the Googles. And I've made a museum. That's a museum from a meeting that we have in Brazil. It's a fantastic meeting. I invite you when we have here, usually in June or July, we go to... Uh, uh, basically a bottle one site that's uh, one of the most darkest sites that exists in the world and uh, it's so wonderful and you can see the Milky Way overhead and uh, I've made a, a VR software that uh, shows the place pre presents all imaging from my friends and also I have a James Webb telescope you can go over the, the, the telescope to take a look or observatories I will show to you and seismology, as, as I've told you. <clears throat> hey, Paulo, do you, uh, yeah. you have a full-time job in the banking system. Yes. Uh, do you I ever have. sleep or are the banking hours really, really short and real? No, 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 it's a full-time, it's a full-time, but I, I, I try to explain how I can do all those things. It's because basically uh, I study three hours every day since I am 10 years old. Then, uh, including Saturday and Sundays. Then basically, I do not need to prepare myself, okay? Then if I need to build a software or something like that, I do this really fast because I already know. I already know all languages. I already know the computers I already. Then it, it, it makes things much faster. That's why uh, it's easier for me to do this kind of things. And, and you know, everything is related because we are talking about mathematics, you are talking about physics, engineering is basically physics and mathematics. Then um, everything that I am showing here to you here is about physics and mathematics. That it was my background. Then um, it's a, I think that you see that's a very interesting uh, 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 work that I do here. The main research works and discoveries. I try, you can search my name in ADS or whatever. You can see the full set of uh, works that I have. But I will, I, will, I will get some to show to you tonight. Uh, one is one supernova that I discovered like uh, 20 years ago that uh, becomes one supernova that was uh, very important for astrophysics. An X-ray transient, uh, the first discovery of a uh, Tidal disruption event, the Zeta poop is strong winds, collisioning winds in Gamma Velorum, and solar system occultations in TNOs. Let me show you. This was the first uh, supernova that I discovered. I discovered others after that. 
But the first one was this 2002 BO. It was a beautiful supernova in the northern skies in the Leo constellation, uh, Hickson 44. It's uh, basically NGC 3190. It's a beautiful set of galaxies in Leo. And uh, the confirmation was in the Leakey Observatory. Uh, and uh, basically, the supernova is. Uh, it, it, it becomes a standard in in uh, in, the, in astrophysics because I've discovered this really early on. At that time, was one of the first uh, one of the, the supernovas that was discovered, uh, basically in the one or two or three days after the explosion. And then a lot of works have been done using the supernova. Even today, you can see here that this is a uh, October thirteenth. 2021 work on this supernova and the probabilistic reconstruction of type 1 1a supernova uh, 2002 bo then this supernova was really something that uh, was amazing uh, another thing that was very interesting that i've done here me uh, yes yes okay uh, the, another thing that uh, was really interesting that I've made is uh, basically I am in a location that's uh, 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 very interesting because uh, see, uh, before me, we have Africa, but Chile is like uh, two hours later. Then I am already at night here while Chile is at day. Then sometimes happens that I am the only guy that has the perfect location to do some things, okay? And this was one of the cases because it was detected uh, an X-ray transient, okay? And this uh, this messaging arrived to me. I was in the central bank working and I received this message. And then I observed that the location of the constellation was uh, a place that was uh, better located for me. In, in Europe, it was uh, very uh, near the horizon. Then, um, then I put the telescopes to take a look and see if I could find a counterparty. And I've done the counterparty and I've, do, I've done the astrom uh, astrometry and photometry and sent to the, to the Bureau. But uh, the, the problem is that a professional observatory in Australia already had sent the same information. But because my information have not matched with the observatory, they decided, uh, I believe Lee, wisely, to put only the observatory uh, uh, positions and observation. However, in the next days, or I believe the two or three days later, the VLA a radio interferometer, they could get a, a, a most perfect position of the transient. And you can see here, this uh, site from VLA, you can see my position is the big cross and the observatory position is basically the round circle and this is the VLA position. Then because of this data, they, they pub published my, my observations later on, even if I was observed first. This is uh, something that happens. Uh, and I believe that makes sense because we are talking with professional guys. No? And even uh, uh, these guys that uh, made these observations, later on, they, they assumed that the calculations were not right. Another thing that was very interesting that I've done here, and um, sometimes I've do alone, sometimes I've do with some uh, other research institutions, okay? And this was uh, a tidal disruption event. And you can see here, it's, uh, it's me here, okay? And uh, this was very interesting. And a tidal disruption event, uh, I believe that's better to show the movie for you uh, and, and it's a very short movie. It's better than I explain exactly what is this. But you can get these uh, papers on the archive, okay? Every paper that I show here, you can get in the archive and take a look. They are very interesting. Let me show you uh, what is this, uh, what's this discovery, the, the, the TDA. On January 21st, 2019, for the very first time, NASA's tests saw a black hole destroy a star. This was a tidal disruption event, which occurs when a star passes too close to a black hole. Extreme gravity causes the star to bulge and break apart into a stream of gas. The tail of the stream escapes into space, but the rest swings around to form an accretion. 
called Assassin 19DT for the All Sky Automated Survey for Supernovae, which first identified it, happened in the TESS Continuous Viewing Zone. TESS's four cameras scan large sectors of the sky, and one constantly monitored this region for a full year. TESS saw Assassin 19BT as soon as it started to brighten, days before other observatories spotted it. NASA's SWIFT satellite quickly observed the outburst in visible light, UV, and, along with the European XMM-Newton satellite, X-rays. The UV measurements are the earliest recorded for a tidal disruption to date. They showed the event's temperature dropped almost 50% in just a few days. Such a steep decrease has never been seen in a tidal disruption before. These outbursts are rare, happening only once every 10,000 to 100,000 years in a galaxy like our own. Future discoveries will help us learn even more about these uncommon cosmic blasts. Then basically, let me come back here. Okay. Uh, basically, this is the paper, okay. I am in the paper because it, it, it was detected here in this observatory and I I could, uh, I, I, usually I do, when I can, I, I do spectroscopy, but sometimes we can do a photometric uh, uh, analysis of the object to see the temperature and to see what kind of thing was happening there. I will show you one example of uh, Dwarf Nova that I've discovered here. Uh, here is another, another work that I participated to is a periodic transient in ESO 253G003. And this is uh, also, I am here, you can see. And uh, this is also a very interesting uh, work. And usually we work here with professional astronomers worldwide and they ask us to do some observations because we have some uh, equipment that's possible to, to make these observations or even our location sometimes is something that makes a difference. And you can see here, what is this? Basically, this this work that I showed to you. This one is related to spectroscopy. Hey, hey pa Paolo, a yeah. question. Yeah. Um, on that last, uh, you don't have to go back, but on that uh, the last thing you were showing, was you don't did that with the with the big twenty inch um, scope that you showed us, or was it with the spectroscope? No, it's basically. Uh, let me tell you, it depends on the case. Okay, then um, what I need to 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 see is. Uh, basically the brightness of the object, the fact that sometimes the object's slow in the horizon, then um, <clears throat> some telescopes like the big one cannot go everywhere in low in the horizon. Then sometimes I need to use the Ricci Crechen telescope or even the C14. Then it depends on, on the special cases. But what I do 
is uh, basically I use spectroscopy in some cases or photometric filters. I have here the UB, UBV RRI set Johnson and I, I have also Ugris sets. Then I have all sets of photometric filters here to do a, a more detail, detailed observations. Then what I do is the following. Typically, sometimes I detect myself here. Sometimes as a, as a, a assassin detects something and asks to me to check what, what's going on. Then I get a, a, a imaging or filter the imaging to see what's going on. And professional astronomers analyze this and we discuss this eventually. But uh, this is the work that they usually do because they, they understand really uh, much better what's going on. Then uh, usually I do the work to detect things and, and to measure and to sometimes I know what's going on and I, I ask them to see or oh, take a look on this because something is happening here. Then it's, uh, it's basically each case is different from the other one. Then uh, for, for, ex for, for example, this here is a spectroscopic analysis. I, I can show you uh, now because it is, uh, uh, let me show you, I, I will share. Because I have a good good night here, I can share with you my, let's see if uh, the telescope uh, disappeared here. I need to call it again because I use uh, basically, um, it's a VNC. It's a, I have several computers here. But the observatory has some 20 computers running. Then I need to get each one. And sometimes I, I do not remember the addresses. But I, I will try to show you. Uh, I will show you later to, to not stop the, the, the presentation. But I will show you later the, 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 the spectroscopy I am doing here from Ashana. OK? But basically. Uh, this is an example of work here that's basically spectroscopy, not imaging at all. Then the, this, this kind of uh, research works are, are wonderful. This takes usually one to two years of observations. And I try to follow, we try to follow, usually it's me in Brazil and some two or three friends in Australia, okay? Then in the Southern Hemisphere, there are these four. Then, um, and I, I, I am basically alone in the other side. Then to, to have a, a full, a full a completion of the day, they need the Australian data and my data here to have a, a, a full day uh, data. Then um, in a case like this, uh, this is a, a, a follow up of, uh, it's difficult to say to you, but I would say, that's like a one and a half, two years of uh, maybe 60 to 100 spectra uh, and one each day. Then we try to follow and see what's going on and, and the results are wonderful. Uh, it's, I, I have no much time to explain everything here because it's, uh, it's very detailed, but I, I will show you in this case here, I, this is one of the most wonderful pictures that I've seen because I've helped to, to generate this and th this is wonderful. Basically is to the right is the theoretical. There's a theoretical uh, uh, analysis of how uh, a spot was over, uh, 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 over a star. And here to the left, we can see the real uh, spectral observations and you can see the, the features here already. <laughs> Then you can you can take a look on the papers. They are really long papers, like forty pages, and uh, very detailed. And basically, uh, what we do in spectroscopy, and I'm doing now like uh, three different stars for three different researchers. Then uh, we take a look on some stars during a huge period of time, and then uh, the researchers develop a theoretical. Uh, ideas about what's going on in these stars. And then we have a BE stars, we have O stars, uh, several different kind of stars. Uh, here's an evolution. Hello? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We have a, a question in the chat. I'm not sure if this is a good time for it or not. Maybe you could tell us. Is it okay to ask? Okay, okay, you can ask anytime. Okay, it says, uh, how do you do the spectroscopic calculations? 
or what camera do you use to do the spectro uh, spectroscopy? Okay. Are there any specific filters which are used to the analysis and what is the field of view of the 20 inch scope? No, let it's me, in let the me... chat there. Okay, okay, okay. That's a big one. Okay, let's start with uh, the spectroscopy. Basically, the spectroscopy, I use it a, a mid uh, 12 inches ACF. It's not necessarily a telescope like that's because I have this one here. Uh, in fact, I use a, a higher resolution a spectroscope that's called ALHIRES3. And this uh, spectroscope is not that um, cheap. Is um, with everything is like five five thousand bucks, and then this spectroscope is attached with two two cameras. One is a guiding camera that I use like a 120 mm from Zool, and the other is a KHY. I do not remember 22 or something like that. It's a CCD, and then. Uh, basically, this uh, when we do spectroscopy, we have a really long, 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 long time exposures. I take exposures from one star for three hours, four hours. And uh, basically, what we need to do is that we, we need to put the telescope, uh, the star, over a slit, because there is a mirror with a slit in the middle. This mirror uh, comes back to the guider. But the slit passes the, 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 the star directly to the diffra diffraction grating. Then uh, we can guide because we can see the borders of the star. Then it guides the border of the star to the star, stay in the middle of the slit, and then it goes to the grating, and then goes to the main CCD, and then we can see the, the basically we can see the, the, the spectrum. Then uh, what kind of software do you use to reduce the data? Uh, there are some, all, all of them are free. We, you can use a uh, more professional software, okay? Like IREF, for instance, or you can use a uh, software that's uh, Windows-based, like, like uh, ISIS. And uh, this software is not really easy to use. You need to understand a lot on how things works. But at the end, after you have all things set, it's really fast and you can put the images and basically it get the images and align the images and remove uh, cosmic rays and so on and, and do whatever uh, to, to give you the final spectrum. Usually what I do is I do even animation on this. I, I get spectrum for instance for four hours, but I sum up like uh, 30 minutes and try to see the dynamics of the, the lines. And I've done this already several times. This, this kind of thing that you are, you are seeing here in the screen is one of the animations that I sent. It's to show you how this was really going on in a period of, of hours. And uh, well, related with, uh, with the, the, big, the big telescope, I, I use uh, different uh, cameras, then I can, I can, I can have a, a field of view that's very variable. This telescope is like F4, okay? Then it's like a 2,000, uh, 2000 uh, millimeters uh, focal distance. Then I, I, can, I can do whatever I need to do with this telescope. Then sometimes I, I've, I've put uh, an example of this Copernicus image. I put this with an, a Barlow. Uh, I, I, do not, I, I do not remember, so it's five times or something like that. And it was a length of a uh, focal length of uh, 50 meters or something like that. It's so something crazy. Then uh, we can change this. It's not, uh, the telescope is very versatile in this sense. I do not know if I answered or if you need some other detail. Uh, thank you so much. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, then uh, another thing that we use is basically uh, for the spectroscopic evolution of a uh, NOVA. Nova star. Then I I have some uh, some agreement with the universities in in in, um, in Japan because they 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 love this kind of thing. Then sometimes they ask me to 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 do some follow up, and because of this we have some ATL uh, an ATL they 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 put a lot of, 
explain what we have seen and the, the, the lines and what's the stage of the nova, the kind of nova, if it's an iron nova or whatever. Okay. Then we work also here with occultations. Uh, we have a really wonderful team in Brazil that uh, makes occultations in, in TNOs and these uh, mm -hmm. objects far, very far away. And they even discovered uh, the first uh, rings in a, in a TNO, I believe that was in Sharko. Then this is an example, you can get these papers, you can put my name and see all the papers. And this is an example of uh, transits mm -hmm. and things like that, that sometimes you use several different scopes here to, to, to do this. And how I do this, I told you that I have here, I don't know exactly, but like 20 computers in the observatory, why? Because uh, I think that today, when you use astronomy for research in some ways, the, the, the computers are really something that uh, you need to have uh, uh, the best as possible. I have here two servers with 128 gigabytes, each one in memory. Uh, they, are, they are HP servers. And I have one telescope, one computer for each telescope and some other things. And, and then uh, I think that this is the full setup that allows me to do several things. Like uh, I have a time server here to guarantee that my time is perfect. Uh, because when you are doing occultations and things like that, you must have a, a perfect timing. Then uh, there are a lot of, of uh, things related with astronomy and computing, IT, that uh, you need to take care to work when you do research, but because when you are doing astrophotography, then it's basically the beauty of this thing. You, you, you do not care if the, the, the clock is a bit ahead or something like that. But when we are talking about research, time is very important. Then it's something that I need to go through here. Uh, in terms of astrophotography, I do, as I told you, it's not uh, something that I do. I do because I'm testing some some telescopes and things like that. You can see in the astro beam. I have here, uh, uh, basically, I will send you the presentation if you want later on to take a look, but I have here like a book when I show some, uh, some Im images. Th these are very old images. Mm -hmm. This is very interesting. This was a transit of Venus that I was observing here and take a look at what will happen. At, at the moment that I, 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 I was done the photography. A plane crossing exactly the same at exactly the moment. And here are some comets, okay, Lovejoy. And this is uh, about a, a gamma velorum because this is one thing that I do also. When uh, we present this research, I do the high quality imaging for the researchers to show in the, when they present in the Congress and thing like that. And these are the, some of the images that I generate. This is a Gamma Velorum that's a, a, a star that's in basically 80 stars uh, rotating. Uh, it must be crazy, the orbits of this thing. But uh, here we have some nebulas and thing like that. And I, I cannot, I, I will tell you something, as, uh, not a secret, but one thing that was amazing for me is because we use it here in the Southern Hemisphere to have a, 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 a wonderful uh, night. And I remember that the first time I've been in US or in the Northern Hemisphere and I've seen the, 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 the sky at night, I've asked it to myself, why these people like the sky? Because the difference is so huge. Then when you came here in the Southern Hemisphere, I would tell you that you need to do this trip. It's something absolutely amazing. Then uh, it's what I, I told you, if uh, we go through this COVID times, uh, it would be very interesting in our party if somebody of you want to, to be here because it's a wonderful party. It's like we have like 40 guys in there. All of them are very... Uh, guys that have experience and, and love this and the places are wonderful mm -hmm. and the sky is ab absolutely outstanding. Uh, you can see the center of the galaxy exactly at the zenith. Then it's uh, something that you need to come here to see the Magellanic clouds and so on. These are some photographs, mm -hmm. as I told you, it's, it's not my, 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 my business, but I, it's basically, I do this because it's part of what I do. 
Here is an example of an image that I've made with this huge 20 inches. You can see at the left, my image, this to the right is the DSS-2 image. This is the DSS-2. And this is the Hubble image. In this image here, I've, I've got with this telescope like was like, I rem if I remember something like 30 or 40 mm -hmm. minutes exposure, it got uh, galaxies of magnitude 23.4. Then it's, uh, it, this is an example. You can see that uh, a star of magnitude uh, 13 is saturated in the, in, the, in, the, in the image. Then it is an example of something that I've done here. I was trying to detect some uh, Einstein uh, rings in this, as, uh, in this galaxy. Then it's an example, it's, a, it's basically, this one is a beautiful uh, southern galaxy in Centaurus, Centaurus A. Uh, some open cluster here. This one of my my lovely best uh, images that I, I like. It's basically one of the the uh, quasars that quasars that are very very far away. It's a PK, PKS uh, two thousand three hundred thirty. This is Sagittarius and it's seventeen magnitude and it's basically ten billion light years away. Then it's, uh, this is another another image that I've made with this big telescope, and this is compared with the DCS2 uh, image. And this uh, basically was, was a supernova. And uh, this is some cooperations that I have here and there with this uh, universities or something like that. They ask me to something. Sometimes I participate. And this is the software that I've developed. I can show you here in real time this running. Uh, this is uh, what I'm showing you in the screen is a discovery. Uh, basically it's how I do. Then the software uh, is something that I developed and then there is no software like this uh, outside. And what is this? Basically it's a pipeline. I, the telescopes here get imaging and sent to a server. Then I have the first pass that's a software that extract the information that is in the, the picture, okay? All stars or all, all, all objects, do some basic astrometry and photometry. Then I go to a second pass where I do some kind of regression and try to have a better a, a photometry. And I match this with a Gaia catalog and Glades galaxy catalog, I match this. And then because I've matched and all information that was in the picture, I've turned the numbers. I do not need any more the picture. It's only for me to see. Then the software matches and tells me what is not in the catalogs or what is different from a catalog, a star that has a, 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 a brightened or, or dimmed in some way. And it informs me. Then I... I take a look and see uh, really fast what's going on. And this is an example of a real discovery. And then the, the software detects, you can see here, it, it not only detects, but it, 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 it does mm -hmm. astrometry and photometry in very, very, very precise ways, very precise. Then uh, I, I have here already all the coordinates of this object, including the magnitudes, okay? And then I put even the error associated with the measure. And here I can see the DSS too, that I can get a red or blue or infrared picture. I press a button and I can see that there is nothing here. And to check what's this, it's not sufficient to see what's, what's in a DSS picture because you can have something that's an infrared star or something like that. Then I have a, a lot of uh, possibilities here to check in wise or pan stars or vizier or simbad cds whatever i press a button and it shows already what's this and i can analyze what's going on then when i analyze and see that there is some counterparty or or there is nothing there i know what is this then i put the telescopes to do photometric imaging and you can see here what you are seeing the star is exploding, it's blue. See, 
then I can see what is this. Because if I, if I, I've seen this as a red star, I would know that the phenomena was different. And this was a dwarf nova, basically. Then uh, I've discovered a lot of different things like this, supernovas and so on. And, and uh, I've upgraded the software now and I can even check immediately. I will show you here. I can see a trace in this, in this the, the screen and I press a button it, it tells me what's this uh, satellite and say, okay, this is a satellite uh, XYZ. And it checks out automatically asteroids and things like that. Then I can check almost everything. The software also generates automatically observations for the MPC and for AAVSO already everything ready. Then I press a button and then imagine that I get uh, the image, okay? Uh, full frame image. And I press a button here to check variables. It simply will get the, G the G G GCVS catalog and match with the stars, locate the variables and send to me the precise photometry of each variables and a red built the AVVSO uh, a file, I press a button and send to AVCO. Then it's basically, uh, it's uh, like a, um, um, a lot of uh, fun with astronomy. And I've done this to uh, basically to play. And uh, I will show this running after the presentation. But this is the for the guys that to, uh, wants to understand better the, the IT part is how it works. I have computers in each telescope. This goes to a virtual machine Ubuntu running in a, uh, in a server. And then it goes to a second, uh, in a pipeline, it goes to a second software that I developed here, checking with Gaia, Glade and GCVS. And then I run the software in a third computer where I do whatever, okay? And I've already have processed more than 8,000 images and more than a, now I've seen a hundred million objects. Uh, this is uh, very interesting. It's what I told you about the VR uh, museum, okay? This, this was an idea that I had was the following. We do this meeting in a, in a farm. Uh, it's not far away from Brasilia, like um, maybe 150 miles away, okay? But it's completely dark. And then uh, it's a wonderful place, it's a farm. And I've, I've built a synthetic museum in VR, exactly in the place where we used to see. And I've put inside this museum, all photographs of my friends, they presenting and talking about uh, their experience and so on. And you can even play with a lot of different things. Let me show you, this is an older version, but you can see and get the software to test. Yeah. Let me uh, remove the, the audio here to explain better. You can get this software because I've put this for free. It was only a play in the YouTube. You can get the software and take a look in your VR Googles. And you can see here, uh, you, this is very detailed when you see in VR because I tried to put in really, really high resolution and this is a 3D. Then you cannot see in the image here, but you can see the mountains in 3D when you are with uh, your goggles. And this is an example. Uh, this is an example here of uh, several objects you can see. I've put the, the, the day and night running fast for people to see the constellations and and things like that okay this is a basically uh this is a, a 360 uh uh movie okay you press and it gets from youtube some movie and show to you in 360 uh you can see inside it here's inside the this planetarium it's it's it's, it's really uh wonderful and uh, here you can see uh, the museum. I've already put the people, I've digitized, I, I've, I've got the photographs of my friends and I've generated a 3D model of them. And then I put a real guy there. I, I am here, you can see, it's I am in the computer talking. And, uh, and uh, basically you can, when you stop in front of some, uh, some photographs like this here, let me show you more here. Uh, the, here is a, in a scale. 
this, this is a perfect scale, not only in size, as in the speed of rotation. And you can get really near the planet to see as if it, it was there. And you can see the difference in sizes. And uh, it, there are a lot of different things here. And, uh, and even I've, I've put, for you to have an idea, this is a farm. And I've been to the place where we put the telescopes. And I've got some telescopes that people developed for free in the internet and I put there. And my idea is not something that I had, I, I had time now to do, but my idea, you can see the galaxy here when you put to see Andromeda. My idea is that you can change the telescope and even see when you take a look and see the galaxy. Then uh, this basically was like, uh, uh, you can see here, uh, I've got some training that some friends have made in YouTube and I put in a real computer in the frame. Then you can sit in front of a computer and take a look on the presentation and so on. And the sky is really the sky that I have in this place. You can see here, uh, Alpha Centauri and Crooks. You can see Eta Carina. Then uh, I've put this uh, now, I put James Webb, I put Hubble telescope and you can enter in the telescope. And you can see the size and so on. It's very interesting. Uh, I have a YouTube channel where I share with my friends a lot of things, not only about astronomy, because I talk about everything. Then I talk about history. For instance, here is a battle of Midway. I was trying to explain uh, how the battle of Midway happened and the context, the historical context and so on. Then I talk not only about astronomy, but several different things like philosophy, like uh, history, archeology span and things like that. Uh, well, my latest project, and I, I'm looking for time here, but uh, my latest project is radio astronomy. I'm trying to build a radio interferometer here. And uh, I already had the, the, the spectrum analyzer, everything set up here, but I do not have time to, to work. But I likely I will retire this year in the middle of the year. Then I will have time to do all this kind of thing. So only to close the presentation, let me show you uh, the real thing working is this. You can see here, it's, it's the full screen. Let, let me put, a, a, I believe that's small for you. I cannot change this. Uh, basically what you are seeing here is the software as running. Lane, let me tell you an example, as I told you, I select the, Im the image here and I say, okay, variables, check. It check the variables and tell me that they found two variables this is V0598 puppies and this is V0603 puppies. This is our image that I've, I've take, I took like uh, one hour ago. And then it shows to me not only the magnitudes that it, uh, the software calculated as it shows the variation that's expected from the star and what the type, this is a peculiar uh, spectrum Okay, and the type of the variable is the same here. You can see that's 12.42 and here say 12.9. And I, I already have the full file you can see here that you can send automatically to AAVSO because as has everything here. And I, how it works, basically I can get one of this image here and say, okay, let's uh, pick up this catalog. And let's, uh, for instance, uh, get the first, th the first thing that is strange for him. And he, he observed this star, but it calculated for me and showed that this is a high proper motion star. Then if I show here to the right, you can see that this star is not in this place because in, originally it was moved from, so you can see that's not in the, in the correct place. Okay, and here you have all data from the star. Then I have, uh, uh, here I've measured 12.25 because this is a saturated star. That's why it, it measured wrong. I, I can tell here for you that any star in this image 
that's lower than 13.67, you cannot tr trust in the photometry because it's saturated. But here you can see all data of Gaia catalog related with uh, the error in distance and so on. Okay, you can do a lot of things here and I can check this in real time, everything. Let me tell an example, galaxies. I will try to check in this image all galaxies. Excuse me, Paolo, we have okay. a question. Well, um, yeah, in the chat and it's okay. Uh, okay. Do you have any other imaging wavelengths other than visible and radio? No, I, I, I have capabilities here to work with in the infrared, in the near infrared, why? Because uh, the telescopes are not refractors, okay? Refractors are not good for this kind of work. It's basically for astrophotography. But if you are doing research, refractors is not a good idea. Mm. Uh, these reflectors, uh, they, they, they are very wide in terms of uh, capabilities in the infrared. And when I buy a camera, I take this in consideration, okay? Then I get a camera that's very good in infrared. Why? Because what, what, I, what I'm trying to do here is basically trying to capture galaxies or quasars that are billions light years away. Then this, this kind of object is, is usually far away in the infrared. Then I get cameras that are more infrared. Then I can go in the spectroscopy around to 9,000 angstroms, something like that. Then it's, it's far away in the infrared. You cannot see this. It's totally blocked. But uh, it's basically this. And you can see here from the, this image that I processed that it told to me that the, the farthest distance that I have in a galaxy in this image is this galaxy here that's 920 million light years away. And I can pick up this galaxy or any other galaxy here because it detected all galaxies in the image. And when I press something like that, it will show me the image here of the galaxy and it will show here to the right, the image in the DSS. And it shows to me that this galaxy is basically 500 million light years away. <clears throat> and this is the magnitude in B and J. You can see here that I take care of the infrared magnitudes. That's why I have J, H and K, why? because this is very important for me to identify the kind of stars. Then we, if I see that the star is really bright, you can see here, the red shift here is clear. You can see that in blue is 18 and visual is 16 and red is 14. And then in K is 13. Then you can see really the red shift here. Then, that's, then this kind of software for me is, is important because I know what's going on. Then let me, let me show you if I suspect of this object, I can call WISE. Then when I press here, it, show, it goes directly to the WISE site and goes directly to the object and shows to me. See, I can see in the far infrared how this object behaves. Then I can, uh, for instance, I can go to Vizier, for instance, and say, let me say, I, I need to understand better this object. Then what I do, I do paste here because the software already had put everything here. Then I put here like uh, five arc seconds and say, inform me basically in all available catalogs in astronomy what we know about this object. And then it shows here everything about this object. You can enter here in TNS, for instance, TNS uh, uh, supernova. Let me show you. Because here you can see something that I've done. Then you can enter here in TNS. Let me see if I log in. I usually I do not log in from here. Let me see if I remember the password. Let me take a look. No, it's not that one. Let me see another one. It's not necessary, but if I enter here, I think that's better. Okay, that's it. Okay, save for me. Okay, nice. Okay, let's close here. Then when you go here, you can do a search. I'll show you an example. This is the Transient name server 
from International Astronomical Union. You can get here in advanced search and put the discover name or internal it's discover Casella. And then you can uh, you can get uh, let's see, let's put here years, three years, four years, five years. I do not remember the, the length of this. Then you put here and you can see what I've, I've sent to TNS. Then you can observe here some examples. Uh, this one is uh, an atlas. Then you can see that I, I compete here with big surveys like atlas, like ZTF. These are the guys that generates thousands of transients every night. And I need to, to sometimes to get earlier and I, and I can get earlier. Why I can get earlier? Because I am much faster than them. I, I take the picture, I process, and I know what's going on. And I, and I in 15 minutes or one hour, I put the information there. It's much faster. I've, I, I am totally certain that the first discovery online I've made using the software, because usually in Brazil, as strange as it seems, People like to see when I search this and then I open a YouTube video and people uh, keep seeing I, that I'm searching. Then I've discovered a star like this uh, during a, a live, then it was, they have shown how things, uh, how I discovered, how I processed the information, how I check it and how I sent the information to TNS. Then this is something that's really interesting. And you can see, for instance, let's see one thing like this. Uh, this is an example, okay, of a discover. I, I've discovered here, and you can see that uh, Gaia uh, generated an alert uh, after that. And I ca you can see here uh, the object. And I show, I, 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 I gave the, the photographs, I gave the image, the, the, the positions, everything. Then it's uh, basically, <clears throat> Is the way it works, okay? You can take a look later on on this to see if you are interested. Well, I will not show everything in the software, but the, the, the software does a lot of different approaches and a lot of different things. And uh, it Excuse captures, when okay? When you're in a good place, we have a couple questions. You let me know. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, are, do you have, um, are there any exotic coatings on your telescope mirror? preferably gold for infrared observations? No, 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 it's not necessary. See, the infrared that you use in telescopes like this, they are very near infrared. But when we are talking about gold, we are in a far infrared. I mean, I mean, it's, it's not something that you use here. Uh, then uh, for you to use infrared in big telescopes, you need a lot of money, a lot of uh, special uh, hardware. What I do here is what's possible to do with the cameras that we have. Then, if we if we go here, uh, if we sh uh, we show to you, uh, let's let's get again the the browser here. If you, if you show to you, uh, let me show you for instance the uh, as the Zoo two nine four. Classes that they were looking to get. Let me show you an example on how to interpret the curve, the spectral curve of the of the camera. Then this camera is a very nice camera for infrared, for instance. Why? You can see here it to show. Uh, let me show. It's here. You can see that the camera gets almost fifty percent of quantum efficiency at a basically 8,000 angstroms. This is, this is infrared, it's totally blocked for our vision, from our vision, okay? Mm -hmm. Then you can see here that this camera will get some information to around 9,000 and so on. This is what the camera allows me. I do not know exactly the mirror, uh, how far it can go. I, I remember that when I, I I acquired this from John Hall. I said to him, okay, I want the best surface as possible. Then he managed to get one wonderful surface for me, uh, a special coating and sent to me this, but I'd never measured this. 
And I think that it works up to, let's see, eight, 9,000, something like that. There is another question. Yes, thank you so much. Um, people want to know if you've done any exoplanet observing. Ah, this is very interesting. You can see here in the second tab, exoplanet is something that I am developing now. Because okay. as, you, as, you, as you may see from what I've, I've shown, I'm not interested to do follow-ups of things. I'm not interested to check if a transit will happen. It's, it's not the work that I, I, I am interested. I'm interested really to get to a, a new one, okay? Like tests. Then what I've done, because every, everything here is recorded, then I have a huge database. I have 100 million objects. I have 400 gigabytes of data of all these objects with photometry, astrometry, and so on. And because of this, when I get one picture, I get all information of all objects of the picture and store this. Then what is this, what is this model that I'm developing here? Basically, I'm getting a, a telescope. I get like a 30 seconds picture and say, okay, take 30 second pictures during four hours. And then I generate like a hundred images, 200 images. Then I do the photometry and astrometry of all objects and try to make a, a curve of a, a light curve of each star. But basically comparing, this is a bit complex because we are talking with different uh, 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 errors involved depending on the magnitude of the star. Then what I'm developing here is a way to match all stars against all, against all stars. And then it shows to me, okay, take a look on this tree because they have a behavior that may be that's a transit or something like that. This is what is a plan that I have. I do not have time yet, but I am doing, I am trying to do. And this is already, it's already I'm doing some things here. I, I'm doing something here. Like for instance, here I, I press a button and it shows me all the all stars of the image. And I can select one star here and select comparison stars. Now I'm doing this manually, but I, I want to do uh, this uh, in a more automated way. And here it shows uh, absolute photometry, relative photometry, mm -hmm. and then uh, we need to go really uh, down in precision, okay? And here I saw what I'm doing and then I try to use flux to see and so on, something that I am developing yet. But the idea is to, to reach uh, a high precision in terms of photometry of all stars in the field, then the, above some magnitude. Hey, is, Paula, yes. this is... Uh incredible to say the least um we're, we're kind of running out of time here because we have some other stuff uh things that we need to get to tonight um and um are you uh okay or willing to stay out a little bit later for after the meeting if anybody has uh, additional questions oh yeah no problem okay. uh i don't think you sleep anyways but i you know so uh or eat no, no, it's uh <laughs> for me it's fine i've uh and basically i've i've uh I've already done through the, the presentation. And uh, it was my idea to show to you what we do here. Well, you know, I, it was fantastic. You know, we'll get all kinds of feedback and there'll probably be other questions. Um, but I tell you, you know, if we were all in person, you'd be drowned out by the sound of the applause. Thank but you, thank you, thank you. Just, uh, it's amazing <laughs> that one person could have that much in their head. Before, yeah. before we move on, can I just a quick question? Uh, are are you physically there alone? Do you have other people helping you? No, no. I, I do this in part time usually. It's, um, but it's because I told you, people ask to me, what are the languages that were developed on this? And I say a lot of languages. We have Fortran, C++, Java, uh, Python, everything you can imagine, C sharp, because, because I work with this really from the beginning. I have here another building like this behind that's a treasure of all the computers. I have everything there from 
C64, C128, uh, Atari ST, Amigas, Apple IIs. I, I work with this. They are running there. Then I have a, I have a next station. I have a, a servers, a HP servers running next step. I have everything there. Then it's, uh, see, I have a huge experience on this. Then I, I work with software. I develop it in, this, in the central bank. <coughs> I designed and developed the software that basically manages all the international reserves. See, then it's, uh, it's because I, I, I have the experience on this. Then, and, uh, but I've used a lot of softwares for other guys. Then for instance, I use S-Tractor, uh, SCAMP, that are professional level uh, uh, astronomical software, but I've adapted these softwares and I've changed them. It's, this is what I've done. Fantastic. Well, thank you again. Thank you. We'll uh, hang on and after the meeting, I'm sure there'll be other questions and you guys can keep on going until uh, you're tired. So, okay. all right. So moving along here, that was just awesome. Um, next month, we have uh, a couple of presenters. One is our own Arjun, who uh, Paulo was asking you uh, most of the questions that were on the chat today. And uh, he's gonna talk to us about uh, quantum tunneling and nuclear fusion and how it works in the sun. So uh, looking forward to, to that. And um, I've seen his YouTube and stuff and he's, 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 uh, he's gonna be Paulo as a successor. There's no question at some point. Um, and then uh, we have a very exciting 90% um, uh, plus done uh, speaker from, that will uh, um, that uh, Arjun will follow, um, and he's uh, he's a an author in astronomy. He's written over 60 books. We have at least one of his books in our library, and. Uh, we just, uh, Ken Sal has uh, been work, talking with him and he's uh, ag agreed to do this. It's working out the final details and then we'll put out the, uh, the announcement to the group. It's very, very exciting. So stay tuned for uh, more information on, 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 uh, on the February guest presenter who will be joining our June. So getting back to James Webb, I'm gonna turn this over to Dennis uh, Conti and um, and uh, Dennis is gonna explain uh, what he's done here. Um, so Dennis, I'm gonna turn it over to you. If okay, you can I share, yourself. share my screen okay? Um, yeah, and I, I've got some stuff that you sent me too. Go ahead, go uh, start, you, and I'll go to yours you, later on. Yeah, you have to give me permission to share. Oh yeah, 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 I'm sorry, I gotta unshare mine. And you should be able to go now. Okay, can you see my screen? Mm, not yet. Hang on. There you go. How about now? Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. Good. So, um, so since JWST was launched, I've been able to take um, four observations, uh, some of which I'll show you in a minute. And in so so doing, I'd like to just say a few words about um, how we can drive JWST's true direction of travel and uh, somewhat contrary to what we think it is from some single observations. I wanna thank Wayne for uh, providing a link to the JWST ephemeris from which uh, I was able to do some of these observations. So um, the observations I took, this is the timeline kind of which Bill showed earlier. My observations took place the night that the sun shield was deployed. Um, second observation, uh, was three days later, a fourth observation, four days after that. And the last observation was the night before last. Um, the magnitude in Gaia terms of the first observation was about 14.1. And to give you an idea of how dim things have gotten, uh, the night before last, it was down to 17.3. So let me just show you the first and the last observation then I'll talk about how we are able to derive the true direction of uh, JWST. So this is a video, if you can see the dot in the middle moving from left to right, from one red square to another. 
These are uh, one minute um, exposure frames, um, you know, fairly bright, 14, 14 magnitude. The next observation is very faint, and it took me 10 minutes per exposure to capture it. What you're going to see is very faint blob in uh, the circles that will track it across the sky. So if you just carefully watch the red circle, you'll see um, a little smudge in the background, which is, again, just the night before last. And it, again, it's down to about 17 magnitude. Uh, when it gets to its final destination in a few days, a couple of days, uh, it's probably going to be maybe 18 magnitude or, or so, but still observable, I think, from our backyard telescopes, in my case, in, you know, suburban Annapolis, uh, where the seeing this particular night wasn't that great. Now, let me make a few observations about these. If I plot on a sky chart, um, let's say the observation I took January 8th, uh, you'll see it in the lower right, and you'll see the direction again going from left to right. Now, what's interesting is if I plot on the same sky chart, the observation from January 12th, it's in the upper left. Well, it's kind of like, why is that happening? How could it be like going backwards and starting all over again? Well, it turns out what we're seeing in these observations where we think JWST is going from left to right, what we're actually seeing is the direction of Earth's rotation. JWST is actually standing still. It's us rotating on Earth and so what appears to be JWST tracking against the background stars, it's really us moving. And in fact, the true direction of JWST is that. And in fact, just to confirm that, I took the ephemeris from um, the, um, the link that uh, Wayne had provided and mapped from, in this case, January 8th to January 12th. And it looks like this. So this is the path JWST takes in those blue dots um, across the sky from our point of view. Um, and let me explain why we get that sort of um, S-type S -type path. If we take a look at an observation, we're looking down now um, from, let's say, the top of the Earth. We take a look at an observation that puts the uh, JWST um, star-like point on the star background at the blue dot you see. As we rotate with the Earth and we take the next observation with JWST moving just a very little bit relative to us, you'll see that the perspective changes. And so if we just go around as we're rotating, you get this left to right pattern with no change of JWST. Now, of course, JWST does move a little bit relative to us rotating on Earth. And if we now are able to look through the Earth, continue observing, what we get is reversing direction just from the perspective of the um, observations from Earth. This, of course, then shows this sort of S pattern. And if we continue looking at it over a couple of days, we start getting that S pattern I showed earlier. And in fact, if we now take a look at, if we're able to stop the Earth from rotating and just sit there on the meridian opposite the sun and start taking a look at where JWST is from our point of view, what we see is in this yellow dot, then we see another yellow dot, and this gives us that direction that we saw earlier. And finally, if I were to plot, in fact, all four of my observations, as you see here, and overlay the ephemeris of where the predicted uh, uh, path is, you in fact will see this, which in fact is the true direction of JWST. So the point here is when we're observing objects going away from us like JWST, uh, we have to be aware that what we think is movement um, across the sky uh, could be, in fact, mostly just us moving and not the object itself. And so uh, having said that, it is possible from looking at a number of, the, a number of observations to, in, in fact, um, derive the true direction uh, JWST is going. So that's, um, 
that's all I had to say and just thought it would be interesting from perspective of those of us who are observing JWST tracks. I'm David. Oh, Dennis, Dennis, sorry. That's awesome. Thank you. Any questions for Dennis? It's a little bit mind boggling too, in a way. Uh, okay. I'll stop, stop sharing and you can continue on. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay, so I've got, uh, let me get my sharing going here again. Uh, there we go. All right, you guys should start to see it now. Okay, so what I did is um, I took, a, this is what Dennis just showed you here. Um, the reason for the flashing is, you know, many of you saw during when he first sent us out was because of the, the uh, light pollution um, over where he's on one side of the airport, I'm on the other side, it's just as bad. So there you go. So that's that. And then, um, and then this was done by Brian. Brian, are you on? He could have muted. I don't know if Brian's on or not tonight, but he, uh, this was his uh, tracking of JWST. You can see it, but you got a picture going the other way. But they <laughs> and then, um, and then Wayne. Um, Wayne. Hi. Hey. Yeah. So this was January twelfth from Alpha Ridge Park, and go ahead and start the movie. <laughs> yep. Uh, JWST is pretty faint. It was about 16th magnitude, give or take. You can see it going basically straight up across the center of the uh, frame. And I just added some stuff at the end. I'm going to do it again here real quick. Oh, oh you know what's going on? There you go. Cool. All right. So those were our... Uh, uh, contributions for JWST for this month. And thanks uh, very much to um, Dennis and, and Sean and all that I had no idea and, um, and to Wayne and to Brian. And then, so now here's the, uh, here's your pictures. Here's your images that you sent in uh, uh, to me. And I'm very excited to share these and I'm very excited uh, um, for the sky to clear during the daytime so I could start doing some solar stuff again and showing you guys. <laughs> I don't know if I'll ever see the sun again, but I'm about to trade in my solar panels on my roof. But the, uh, so Cheryl, uh, Cheryl, I know you're on, Did you unmute? Cheryl, these are breathtaking. <laughs> so this is Comet Neowise taken from Spruce Knob on, um, July 21, 2020, um, at the time I took this image, I didn't know how to process it, but I just learned a lot this last past year. And so I can't be going out much with my eye issue. So um, I sort of spent some time redoing some images and this is a redo, this, this is actually a first process but I've learned a lot in the, in the past. So it's a single image of Comet Neowise taken that night with the thunderstorm off in the distance and a rain coming down over the mountains and fabulous air glow. It was really cool. Yeah, incredible. Air glow is fantastic. <laughs> it was a real treat and I didn't even know it was there until I processed the image. Yeah. Yeah, we can't see what help to see what you do when you get good at it, Cheryl. <laughs> this is another image. This one I took last May, um, on May 16. It was taken in Utah at the uh, coral sand dunes. The sand dune in the background, uh, the the pink hill is the largest pink hill is about 80 feet tall sand dune. And it is against in front of these giant mountains in the background. So that was taken from a really dark sky site. And um, I was attending the, the Milky Way conference put on by Roy Spear uh, during this week. And um, um, during that conference, I took a special class on processing and um, 
I was able to process this based on the information I learned from that night. So it, it was pretty amazing experience. It is a tracked image. Okay, so this one is another one that I reprocessed from a while back. This is the moon Venus conjunction that happened on um, December 28 on 2019. And this is actually the second day that I had my Astro Modified camera. I didn't even really know how to use it at the time very much, but I took it to Blackwater Wildlife Refuge. And this was my first experience of the geese um, arriving and uh, from, from the north during their migration. And they settled in um, on Blackwater River during the day and they feed in the shallow waters there. And then at night at dusk, they all launch off at the exact same time in mass waves of geese and they just fly over you with this deafening sound. And the whole experience was the most moving thing I have ever experienced. And now I have been there every three years, three years in a row, I, I've gone to, to experience this. It's just incredible. Well, thank you, Cheryl. Great. So here's one that, uh, Richard, I know you're on, I, I saw you. Um, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, if you could talk about, talk about this is this is quite incredible for, you know, get, catching this in our skies and everything else. And I'll let him explain what he used and how he did it. It's a um, sketch, by the way, this is a sketch. Go ahead. Yeah, this is, this is I'm kind of old fashioned. So uh, this, I do drawings and, uh, um, this was for the Hickson 44, which is galaxy cluster. It's four uh, galaxies that are pretty close together um, in Leo. And um, what I was basically doing from my backyard in suburbia was, was taking my six inch refractor and I was doubling um, uh, with an eyepiece, the new uh, Telview uh, night vision system on top of it, which, um, gives me just about the uh, depth of an 18 inch scope with my six inch refractor. And uh, so I can go a lot deeper than I can without the, uh, the uh, night vision system. So I'm still testing it out, but I'm getting good results, uh, especially considering that um, this was done from, uh, from my backyard in suburbia, um, uh, Columbia, Maryland. Great, thank you. Jared and Christine. Thanks, Phil. Hey. Hey, so um, yeah, these pictures that you're gonna share are all pictures that I've taken over the holiday uh, and up until I guess today, I think um, had an opportunity to share these with the folks in our Discord group. So some of you have seen these uh, over the last couple of weeks. Um, but these were all shot from my backyard in Ellicott City. Um, and uh, yeah, I think everyone's familiar with the, the Horsehead Nebula and Flame. And uh, this was the version I finally came out with, and it's probably version five or six. So uh, I, I had to stop. Um, you know, you never quite get what you want. I think it was an earlier presenter um, earlier on that said that uh, you never finish these pictures, right? You just put them on the shelf or... Uh, um, abandon. abandon them for a little while on this one's going to get abandoned so that's the jim johnson is it jim johnson who said that i, I know wayne. i've heard it before in the group but i, I totally understand that comment now. wayne so, said that oh, wayne wayne also. Said <laughs> it's i've heard it before so there there you go but that that's that's all i have to say on that one yep so close by right i was actually shooting both of these targets um i only have a brief period of time to shoot both of them i get about an hour maybe an hour and a half um, a night um, on both of these targets. So I think this ended up between these two, I totaled about almost 10 hours on both pictures. Um, hard to believe we had that many clear nights, I guess, but you know, add them all up, I've taken advantage of every one of them. So Rosette, and then my last picture was the uh, elephant trunk, uh, just a very close up. Uh, this is a crop picture from a wide field view um, on a red cat. So. Um, I was actually quite happy with being able to get that kind of small field of view and, and such a wide field shot. So 
I really like the way the picture came out. Just wanted to share it with the group. Thank you. Beautiful. Arjun, our, uh, Arjun's yeah. desk. Here's, a, here's some of young Arjun's first shots continuing on. Right, so um, this is my shot of Andromeda. I took it quite some time ago, I think last year. Um, but I just wanted to demonstrate, um, this is how much detail you can get without the stars. And uh, I know that um, Mr. Wayne and some other people pointed out that you don't know how much detail you're using, you're losing if you remove the stars. But then I personally feel like um, this uh, image revealed a lot of the details of Andromeda and I just wanted to share. Um, at the end, I have the star version of Andromeda also. And uh, this is the wizard. So um, I just learned about layer masking. Um, so I had my three channels, which is I prime, H alpha and O3. And um, I just took my H alpha and O3 channels and I combined them and it went through with um, selective color in order to bring this image. And um, I carefully mapped up the O3 regions and the S2, I mean, and the HA regions uh, to form this image. I actually um, ran an iteration of StarNet on this also, and um, I masked the stars back in. Excellent. And yeah, this is the um, star version of Andromeda. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I when, when I went through with Starnet, the text on the side, it got eliminated. So I thought that was interesting because I didn't know that Starnet would think of the text as a star. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's the difference. <laughs> well, very good. And, and you're using a remote telescope that you... Uh... You, yes. You, you, you sign up for time on, right? Yeah, I signed up for time on. This is um, a 242nd exposure and broadband. Right. Excellent. Thank you, Arjun. Gene. Yep. So this is uh, M77 down the bottom there, which is a face on spiral. And there's the other one, NGC 1072. And then the third one, oh, I didn't put the top on the title. But uh, there's another NGC that kind of makes a triangle with the other two. But yeah, the one over down and to the left. That weight in the, on the left side of the picture. Oh, on my side. Yeah, that. Oh, right there. Up a little, up a little. Over to the right. That one. Got it. Right below your arrow. Yep. Oh, yeah, that's the last one. But what was kind of interesting is I was looking at a... Uh, a picture of M77 through a huge telescope. And there's actually three galaxies, well, it's behind that you can see through the through M77. And you don't have to try and find them, but they're, they look like stars on here, but they're the at like 3.30, 4.30 and six o'clock on the uh, M77 pictures. Okay. I don't know, I really, I like looking for the little galaxies in the background. It's kind of interesting. Daniel, you got a question? I got a comment. Uh, this picture here, of these stars in a galaxy, kind of looks like a face. Here's the eyes, and here's the mouth. <laughs> okay. What do you think? Yeah, up well, at the top here. Yes, this right here with the curse is the white areas. Here's the eyes, and this is the mouth. It looks like a face to me. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll go with that. <laughs> there you go. And I like this. Looks like a rainbow right here. Yeah. Rainbow color, very beautiful. Nice job. There's a little galaxy here, a small one in the I've seen yeah. in the background. This is the foreground. Very nice picture. We got to do another virtual star party someday. Yeah, we, we were talking about it. So, so thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Gene. All right, next is Gene. Still stay on, Gene. <laughs> yeah, so this is just kind of a random spot in Cygnus, but the whole area in Cygnus, there's a big area in Cygnus that's just covered with. Uh, emission nebula and I just kind of picked out a, a spot that had a lot of it on uh, you know uh, whatever it's called wiki sky and then just aimed at it and, you know let it go for a while and it came out with all this uh, nebulosity they actually all have numbers it turns out and I guess the brightest part of this is LBN 310 but I didn't know that when I took the picture I had to look it up afterwards there we go okay 
Okay. Thanks, Jean. I think that was it, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, John, are you on? John? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Yeah, so, uh, you know, this one doesn't really need much naming, California Nebula. Um, little, I lost a little detail putting it portrait, but uh, just, uh, you know, doesn't really look like California as much when it's turned on its side. Everybody's used to looking at, at it that way. Uh, so it took, takes pretty wide field uh, to get this one in. And I used a filter um, that isolates uh, HA and O3, although there's not a lot of O3, I don't think. I think it's mostly the, uh, the red HA signal. Great. And do you have another one? Yep, there you go. Yeah, Comet Leonard. Uh, this was my second attempt. Uh, went out to uh, Cars Mill Park one morning with a few, uh, few others in the group yep. here. And uh, it took me a long time to process and until I could get uh, relatively happy with, you know, freezing the, uh, the Comet, stacking those, and then also getting uh, uh, Messy A3 in there. Yeah, we were out late that night. Yeah. Yeah, and it was cold. <laughs> it was, <laughs> although we've had much colder recently. So yeah, yeah, the sun was coming up by the time I left. All right, here we go. Um, just a you know simple moon shot. Uh, I, I don't I usually turn my scope to the moon, but I, I think I was I had some time to kill before something else came out of the trees that night. So I decided to uh, you know see how it looks. I had to crop in quite a bit because I'm I'm only at 550 millimeters, so it's uh, not a real zoomed in picture, but uh, it was, uh, it came out pretty well. I was happy. Very nice. Thank you very much. Oh, you got one more. Yeah, my last one here, uh, Messier One. It's a pretty small, uh, the Crab Nebula is pretty small, but uh, so I, I cropped in on it quite a bit. And, uh, you know, I'm just doing a, a personal challenge to go around and image all the Messier targets. Uh, no big hurry, but when I have time, I, you know, get over there and grab another one. And this was uh, the next one on my list. I was real happy with all the detail that that's in it. Uh, so that makes me, uh, that reminds me, John, I sent out that email to the club. Uh, you got to call the, uh, the expansion challenge, if you will, um, after, you know, seeing the, um, the images from somebody who tracked the expansion of, um, I think it was the crab nebula. Yeah, it was actually the crab. I, I think uh, Adam Block, he's a, a prominent astrophotographer on YouTube. I think it was uh, he that showed it over like 20, 20 some years yeah. that you could see the expansion. In it. And then that's kind of what triggered me to, to pick this one out one night when I was, uh, I had a little time to kill. And um, yeah, I, it's a really interesting target. I wish, yeah. you know, if I had a little bit more uh, focal length there, it'd probably be a little bit more detail, but uh, this makes number 58 out of 110 for me. Yeah. It won't count for anything official because, you know, I just use software to find the targets and things, but it's a, uh, it's a fun little challenge to, to right. see if I can capture them all. Yep. You're closing in Apollo's uh, hundred million uh, images there. So <laughs> that's it. Okay. Um, Jim. So I took the uh, observing challenge of trying to find Venus as it was passing through inferior conjunction a couple Saturdays ago. Um, couldn't get it with the scope, but by placing the sun behind uh, the neighbor's house and kind of sweeping the sky above, all of a sudden I was able to, uh, to pick it out. And what I found interesting was that what really helped was when a jet went by and left a contrail, um, it, uh, it really made it a lot easier to pick it out. And I'm thinking it's because as you move, then you would actually see this little dot move with the contrail since they were both kind of relatively stationary. Um, so it, it was definitely an interesting effect that, you know, if you had something else in the field, it was kind of like being able to, to track them both made it a lot more visible. Was surprised how bright and um, how decent sized Crescent that was. Jim, yeah, I, this is Wayne. I've noticed the same phenomenon trying to see find Venus in the bright twilight. And I think what it is, is the contrail gives you something to focus at infinity on. If you don't have something to focus at infinity, your eyes just constantly trying to change its focus to look at something. Well, but with the binoculars, I think I was focused at infinity pretty, pretty well. Yeah, your I, binoculars I were, but your eye wasn't. Your eye wasn't focused at infinity, so okay. it was, yeah. So I think it's, I think it's more of a, a focusing issue. Sounds yeah, reasonable of, to me. Yeah, it's kind of interesting trying to find uh, objects you look at at night, you know, during the daytime. And uh, one of our 
solar events at Robinson Nature Center, uh, Eric uh, Himnowitz, um, he, uh, while we were focused on the sun, he was showing the visitors uh, Venus during the daytime. And uh, it, it was, it was uh, he had a really nice view. It was a, a rare, beautiful day, so. Yeah, that was one of Herman Hines' specialty was uh, showing people stuff during the daytime besides the sun. He'd do Venus and sometimes Jupiter, and uh, he was really good at that stuff. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, Mengden, are you on? If you're on, I haven't seen him. Well, this is a picture that he submitted, Mengden. Nope. Oh. So another very nice one. And uh, here's another one of his. And then Brad. I know Brad's on, there you go. Hey there. This 12 mosaics, 12 uh, panels, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a 12 panel mosaic of the heart and soul nebulas. Um, it took like most of November and half of December to get all of that. I did, um, so this is with a mono camera and a five uh, inch refractor. Um, and so I did three hours per channel per image. Is that right? Uh, I, it's a total of 36 hours of light, um, this image. And I use PixInsight, which like it turns out is really easy to do <laughs> a mosaic in PixInsight. Uh, so it, it really, once I figured out how to, how to combine everything, it, it really wasn't that, that hard to do. But the, the thing I really like about this is, is showing people this picture on a phone. Like you can just keep zooming in, like you just keep pinching to zoom and it, it looks crazy. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of, it was a lot of work, uh, getting, getting this image done. Yeah. And, you know, having the display, you know, this is one thing that's better here on Zoom than it is when we're live in the Robinson Nature Center because their projector is relatively poor compared mm -hmm. to what our computer displays are. So Joel and I have been discussing uh, um, uh, making a donation, uh, if you will, um, um, to uh, Robinson with a high quality projector. So you, you, know, you really get these sharp images. Daniel, mm -hmm. you're up, you got a question? Is, I guess, is this the heart and soul nebula? Yeah, yeah, it's heart and soul. I I, I've heard of that before and it's very familiar. Why is it called so? Because this is the heart, this looks like a ghost, your spirit. Yeah, you know, and it's weird. If the heart nebula wasn't right there, I'd want to call the soul nebula heart nebula, at least the angle that I have it at. But yeah, <laughs> it's because the one looks like a heart. Ghost is the a dead person. I like to yeah. think the soul nebula looks like a buffalo. And once oh, you see it, ghost. you'll never unsee it. Sure. Yep, I see. Or it could be called heart and ghost nebula because it's white like a ghost. But that's right. Yeah. This is, we're going to use this one for the Hale Rorschach test, and <laughs> we'll give you everybody a little bit of astronomy therapy, and I'm going to ask you all what you see in this, and then uh, we'll analyze, uh, you know, what your personality is when we're done. Great. Thank you, Brad. And that is it. So I want to. Um, thank everybody for joining tonight. I want to thank Jim Johnson once again for all the hard work he did in, in uh, getting the elections together. I want to thank uh, the, uh, the outgoing board and uh, welcome the incoming board and, and I'm proud to be, uh, proud to be, uh, Wayne, if you were saying something, you're on mute. Um, and uh, um, thank you, you know, thank everybody. It was just great. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to officially adjourn the meeting. I'm going to stop the So can I say something really quick? Yes, you can. Hi. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Hannah. I feel like I do know most of you. Um, I just wanted to say I dropped the Google form in the chat, and I am constantly amazed by all, all the unbelievable work that I see here, whether it's drawing setups, any kind of art, photography, videos, all of that. Um, so uh, I dropped the Instagram submission form. And if you feel so inclined, I would love it if you would help continue our outreach through um, Instagram as a platform and you could submit it there. And if you have any questions, my email's on there. Feel free to email me. But 
Yeah, that's all. That's my oh, great. Little... Yeah, then once again, thank you, uh, Hannah, for uh, was, this was actually going to be covered again in the February meeting when I talked about the committees and stuff. And uh, but for for implementing our Instagram uh, social media site, and that will probably develop into our uh, main centralized hub for Hale Images. So just submit them into that form, and then Hannah will get them up there. And there's a lot of links. And Hannah, how many followers do we have and, uh, about right now? Uh, slow but steady, but a couple, about a minute ago, we just got our 152nd follower. So. Right. But we have uh, Smithsonian Air and Space is following us too, right? Yes, they and liked we, our we, picture. They liked yeah. our last image. So yeah. And we pick up their, what, how many followers they have? Like 300,000, right? Or 30,000? They have like 300,000. 300,000. So we indirectly pick up their 300,000. Yes, so, and I ended um, up Space Telescope Science Institute, but I'll find someone, I'll get Grace to bully their outreach people to got come it. on us. So thank you very much. Uh, anybody else before I adjourn? Okay, I'm gonna uh, thank everybody. I'm gonna stop the recording. Hang on.